Welcome, everybody, to the, yes, the final of the series of lectures. Uh, then Peter from Stockholm University will continue. On, uh, I'm not sure what the title was, but it's stable normative theory, normative theory and applications to what we heard yesterday. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's, uh, uh, this is a continuation of yesterday's talk, but it will also be uh, quite logically independent of everything that I said yesterday. So if you were not there, then uh, you have nothing to worry about. And what I said, uh, what I say today will be joined with uh, Jeremy Miller at Purdue. Peter Paxt at Oklahoma and Oscar Randall Williams uh, at Cambridge. The talk will be about proving uh, twisted homological stability theorems with uniform stable range. Uh, but before I get into that, let me tell you some introduction to. The philosophy. What is homological stability? Uh, so you can think about homological stability in many settings. I will just think about families of discrete groups. <coughs> I have a sequence of discrete groups like this. And this sequence satisfies homological stability. If the homology of GM to the I homology of GM plus one as an isomorphism for I sufficiently small with respect to M. When I go far enough into the sequence, the homology no longer changes. In practice, Uh, almost always very important to have a specific bound, not a crude bound like this, and the bounds you get are always on the form i is less than a constant times m plus d. Um, and what you care about the most is c, which is the slope of stability. Uh, so, Some examples to keep in mind. Uh, you can take G M and the M symmetric group. You can take the braid group on N strands. You can take the mapping class group of a surface of genus N with one boundary component. Uh, you can take the isomorphism group. Free group on M generators. Uh, and these are all nonlinear examples. And they're also important linear examples. You can take GLM R, where R is your, not an arbitrary ring, but uh, a nice enough ring to we'll have homological stability. Or you can take other sequences of classical groups, the symplectic groups, orthogonal groups. Should say which flavor of orthogonal groups and so on. But there, there are many examples, that's the point. I should give some names. Symmetric groups uh, are the oldest, that's due to Nakaoka. Grade groups is due to Arnold. Mapping class groups is due to Error. Automorphisms of free groups is due to Hatcher and Volkman. These linear examples is where the subject actually took off in a serious way because of the work of Quillen. Quillen showed that you can compute higher algebraic K theory of a ring R by calculating the stable homology of classical groups associated to R. There are different flavors of K theory. Um, and homological stability in these cases is due to Quillen, Van der Kallen, Mausen, Volkman, Czarny, uh, there are many names you can say. 
Uh, and homological stability is, is useful uh, both as a computational tool. Maybe you can identify the stable homology and then certainly know what the homology is in a range. Sort of an organizing principle. Uh, but it also reveals new structures. So maybe you find these groups to be interesting and you want to calculate their homology. And maybe you, with a lot of effort, can compute the homology of G2. And then you triple your effort and you can compute the homology of G3. <coughs> and then you multiply your effort by 10 and you can compute the homology of G4. But at some point you think that this is not leading somewhere useful. By contrast, stable homology often has a beautiful answer, an answer with, which leads in completely unexpected novel direction. Um, but this was homological stability with constant coefficients, and you're often also interested in twisted coefficients. Uh, so that would mean that you have a sequence of representations of each of the groups. You have maps between these that are suitably equivariant. Now we give a more precise definition of what I mean by a coefficient system and what I mean by a sequence of groups uh, shortly. Influential paper about homological stability with twisted coefficient was written by Dwyer in 1980. Uh, and he introduced the notion of polynomiality for such a coefficient system. Uh, and his motivations were in. Uh, or to break K theory, Waldhausen's uh, A theory, but um, the principle itself turned out to be very widely applicable. Uh, let me tell you what polynomiality means for a coefficient system like this. We find the derivative of a coefficient system A to be the new coefficient system whose value at n kernel Let's assume that this map is injective. Then you would make the definition that A has degree less than or equal to T, the derivative of A has degree less than or equal to T minus one. And A has degree less than or equal to minus one. Um, and with this definition, it makes sense to say that a coefficient system is a finite degree. And no matter how nice my family of groups is, I can't just pick an arbitrary coefficient system and expect have some sort of stability, I need to impose a finiteness condition of one sort or another, and this is a natural finiteness condition. I mean, it's not obvious, right, how, how the boundary bay is a coefficient system, right? No. Okay, but for... <laughs> yeah, I haven't defined formally what a coefficient system is yet. Um, <coughs> I will get there. Here are two examples. The GM with symmetric groups. And 
A M to be the standard representation spanned by n element set. This is a degree one coefficient system. I take its derivative, I get just the constant coefficient system given by the trivial representation, which is of degree zero. Uh, now Shapiro's lemma tells us that the high homology GM coefficients in AM is the same as the high homology of GM minus one T coefficients. Because AM is just say uh, it's a trivial representation of GM and induce it. This is in this particular example. Yeah, in this particular mm -hmm. example is it's got to happen. Uh, Wait, so can you see the reasoning again? Yes, AM is, you can also write it, it's an induced representation from GM minus one GM. Shapiro's lemma tells you how to calculate the homology of an induced representation. Uh, So you see, and this is the point of the example, that we get slower stability with coefficients in A than we did with constant coefficients. We lost exactly a factor of one here. And I could uh, instead take the induction from GN minus two, I would get a degree two coefficient system and I would drop a two here. <laughs> so this was the important part here. Uh, Uh, we can also take EM to be SP2N, say, over T2. Let's take this here. Um, EM, we take the standard representation and we take its 2 amps tensor power. This is of degree 2m by dm and in standard symplectic module q to the 2m. I can't write it. Um, now let's just think about homology in degree zero. Uh, since I work rationally, it doesn't make a lot of difference if I think about homology or cohomology. And I'm really thinking about what are the invariant tensors in this tensor product. And the space of invariant tensors is determined by the <coughs> fundamental theorem of invariant theory. And it's spanned by all ways of inserting the symplectic form. You should pair these two n numbers in pairs. And that gives me a generating set. And you can ask if there are relations between them. And the answer is that there are relations if n is small, but there are no relations if n is large. That's a second fundamental theorem of invariant theory. This turns out to be the free module spanned by perfect matchings to M. Oh, I guess it worked rationally in some Q. Uh, If n is strictly larger than capital M, and it's strictly smaller. 
much less than that. And again, you see that the larger capital N is, the slower you have stability. The range in which you see stability drops with a degree of normality. And yeah, this is just what you should expect. Um, and there's no combinatorial description. Sorry? There's no combinatorial description of the second case. And of this. Yeah. Uh, you can describe explicitly what are the relations in general. It's a complicated uh, one. There's a simple statement, but it's complicated in practice. <laughs> um, now, all, all of these examples that I wrote here and all of these notions of polynomiality, you can axiomatize. And this was done by uh, Oscar Randall Williams and Natalie Wall. Uh, situation. This is Ball. Yeah. Let me go over that. Turns out that it's natural to not just think of this as a sequence of groups, because in all of these cases, there is in fact a monoidal structure present. So you can take an element of Gn and an element of Gm and multiply them to get an element of Gn plus m. So here that would be block sum of matrices. Here that would be pair of pants multiplications of surfaces. Here this would be concatenations of grades. Uh, stability group point. G. Rated monoidal groupoid. With monoid objects. <coughs> natural numbers. Such that. G zero is trivial. And. Gm plus Gm, Gm plus M is injected. And this is not the most general hypothesis put in here. It's good enough for this talk. So sorry, Gn is the automorphism group of. Ah, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so Gm is the automorphism group in this group by G, the object given by M, the natural number. Uh, so this is not the most general definition you can make. Um, you can relax this, you can relax this condition, but braided is very important. You do need it to be able to swap tensors past each other. And in many of these, you actually have a symmetric monoidal groupoid, but the brain groups and the class groups here are genuinely braided monoidal. Like the pair of pants multiplication is E2, but no better. And all these examples, are, or most of there seem to be maps between different integers, but you, you don't make use of that in this definition. No, not at the moment. Uh, with this definition, you can also define properly what is a coefficient system. Coefficient system for a stability group for you. Module. 
by z. Category of functors from g to abelian groups. I can put modules over some ring or chain complex. Um, I take the constant functor with value z, and I think of that as a ring object using day convolution. Sorry? I, don't, I did not understand the convolution. Day convolution? Ah, so G is braided monoidal, and, and this is also a monoidal category. And if you have functors from a monoidal category to a monoidal category, there's a monoidal product on that. <coughs> Could you just tell us what it is? Sorry? Uh, I should be able to. <laughs> Um, well, uh, let me try to do it just in this instance. So I have M tensor M, M <coughs> like this. M and I would then have Z hat of M direct sum uh, of this was the answer. Uh, so here is the tensor product on abelian groups, and here is the Right, so over there. It's not supposed to be something deep. It's a snappy way of saying what it is. Uh, and for example, if G is the union of all symmetric groups, this is the same thing as what's called an FI module. It was introduced by Church, Ellenberg, and Farb. So this doesn't use the braiding in any way. This does not use the braiding, that's correct. Uh, and Randall Williams and Wall also associate to this rated monoidal group for G, a family of simplicial complexes, generally semi simplicial sets, for the destabilization complexes. Say that the zero cells of Wn is given by Gn1, Gn minus one. The one cells are given by Gn1, Gn minus two, and so on. Uh, and what they show is that if you can prove that these simplicial complexes are highly connected, then you automatically get homological stability for this family of groups with any family of polynomial coefficient systems. Uh, this is like 2015, 16 or something. Um, what the G cells of WN. Ah, so zero cells is GN mod GN minus one. One cells that would be GN mod GN minus two. Uh, so K cells would be GN mod GN minus K minus one. <coughs> and so the two maps between those are they from like writing N minus one as N minus two plus one the other way around? Yes, I see. <laughs> And what was the map from GN minus one to GN in this, in this general? Um, Just like some fixed object. Yeah, maybe it's 
I can maybe I should say some examples. Uh, if you take the symmetric group, this reduces to something called the complex of injective words. If you take the braid group, you get something called the arc complex. If you take GLNR, you get something called the split teats building. It's introduced by Charlie. Uh, so if you take GLNR mod GL and minus one R, you will get you're fixing the first vector is the choice of what can be the first vector of a matrix plus a complement of that vector. The zero cell in that case would be a unimodular vector and the choice of a complement. So it depends on some choice, like, uh, uh, like no, these 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 yeah, yeah, I, do not. I, I know, like, this, but like homotopy coherently, that does it depend on like does it? Uh, no, it's it's a canonical construction. Okay, yeah, but but it seems that the inclusion from G n minus one to G n it uh, is not very canonical. Yeah, this may be also not the best way to write it. Yeah, then what's the best way? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about this later. Is that fine? <laughs> If you use this, you have G1 to Vn to V1 plus M, and you have the unit element in Vn, is that what you do? Right. Is this, uh, this map? How to define the solution between the groups? Yes. And uh, so those are groups, so you have to, you can take Vn times the unit element mapping yes. to something, yes. so we give those in terms. Yes. But you also have like G1 times Gn to G1 plus N, like, this seems not very really <laughs> So you do have to use the braiding. Okay. This is actually important, because you have Gn cross G1 cross G1, and you can okay. flip those two G1s past each other. <laughs> Um, so the theorem is that uh, H I G M A M D H I G M plus one plus one, well, not stated very precisely. This is an isomorphism for I at most M minus the degree of A over K. Uh, if Wn is n minus 2 over k connected. So if I have some connectivity of some slope depending on k, I get a bound for homological stability of this form. And here I implicitly assume that the coefficient system is split. If it's not split, did you define the split? Uh, yeah, it means that uh, and uh, there are many variants of this theorem. I didn't state it in the most general way, and I didn't state it in the most precise way either. But this is for any stability groupoid and the polynomial coefficient system, so finite degree. Should I think of this as an easy theorem, like more than just stuff <laughs> that's important? I'm being vegetative here. <laughs> no. uh, um, like there's a certain machine for proving such results. This is, seems like an axiom. It there's an axiomatic. This is an axiomatization of Quillen's yeah. strategy for proving homological stability theorems. So, what is what is nice here is that they find exactly the correct axiomatization yeah. to encompass these examples and give a uniform procedure for writing down the correct completion complex, which maybe is more of an art prior to this, which actually yeah. gives you a recipe for where and what to do. Uh, and I'm not going to go into what Quillen's argument for homological stability is in any detail, because in the end, that's not what we're going to be using, because the point is we need 
to prove a homological stability theorem that does not depend on the degree of polynomiality. So we cannot use this strategy. But let me just say it very fast in words what Quillen strategy is. So the, the, the idea is that you construct a sequence of synclecial complexes or cell complexes of some sort with actions of these groups Gn. And from this complex, you construct a spectral sequence by filtering by skeleton. And you prove that the differentials on the E1 page alternate between being the stabilization maps and being zero. And now, if you can also prove that the complex is highly connected, then it's going to converge to zero in a range. And then stability follows because inductively, you know that a bunch of E1 differentials kill everything except for uh, the last one. And that one is just the stabilization that you have to prove is nice. Point. This is Quillen's. And the argument is trickier when you have polynomial coefficient systems, but it's the same idea. And the polynomiality condition is, in a way, it looks like it's tailor made to slot into that Quillen argument in a neat way. Um, Yeah. So what was the art before in implementing clone strategy? Finding the correct simplicial complex. I see. And it's, there's not one simplicial complex you can use. There are several, and you might get a better slope by finding a clever complex. Here's a canonical complex you can always use. Um, let's do another example. Uh, Let's take a mapping class group of a genus G surface. There's a theorem of error with subsequent improvements by uh, Olson, who proved the stable range, and Ivanov first to do uh, twisted coefficients a couple of years after error. Uh, improvements to the stable range came from Galatius Cooper's. Williams. When I work on this computer, MG1, is it a mark bond or a bond? Uh, a, boundary, a boundary component. Fixed. Yes. Yeah, it's the uh, mapping class group. Uh, so pi zero of different morphism fixing the surface. Uh, sorry, <laughs> not fixing the surface. Uh, the morphisms of the surface fixing a color around the boundary component. Uh, uh, so for this group, is stabilization map uh, isomorphism. Most two thirds minus one minus the degree of a. Now, to note that the best slope you can get using this is one half. So this actually does not fit immediately into the Randall Williams ball machinery, but you can uh, actually make it work there. Uh, this is explained in a recent paper. What, what we prove with Jeremy and Peter and Oscar is that for the specific choice of the D lambda coefficients, you can do better than this. So, um, Uh, fix a partition lambda. Uh, and that B lambda. You now you're talking about mod G, right? Yeah, this is for mod G. Yeah. A 
that V lambda be the representation of SP2G. I um, think of this as a rational or a real representation. Well, all of you, the mapping class group, we lambda conclusions. Morphism for i less than g over 3. Uh, but no dependence on lambda. Uh, so, of course, if lambda is small, this is worse. Uh, but if lambda is big, this is a lot better. Rational. Sorry? Rational representation greater. Yeah, these are uh, rational representations. Uh, and this is a very special feature of these particular representations. There's nothing like it for a general polynomial coefficient system because we saw these examples, and in general, uh, you have to have a stable range that depends on the degree of polynomiality. But for these particular ones defined by systems of reducibles, you, you do get a uniform stable range. And this is precisely the type of statement that I explained yesterday that we want for the braid groups. Here we do have exactly that uniformity now for the mapping class groups. So if lambda becomes large, then this will be of large degree. Yeah, and so this can be of arbitrary large degree, but you still always have a stable range that looks like this. And this is. Uh, This is interesting in its own right. Uh, there is a paper of Decane of about infinitesimal presentations of the Torelli groups. And he has to work very hard to find these quadratic presentations of the multi cell completion of the Torelli group, precisely because there is no genus for which he knew the homology of this. Uh, he needed to know H2 of the mapping class group with B lambda coefficient. Right? So there, there's no genus for which we know that. And actually, you can simplify that paper very much by using this theorem. Can I confuse what, what is B lambda if lambda gets too big? Oh, it's zero. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah I should have said that. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so if the length of lambda is bigger than g, it's at least What this map is? Yes. Um, the g surface. Uh, and there's this, this theorem is not a theorem about mapping class groups. It's a general theorem about stability group points. Uh, we also get a similar result for automorphisms of free groups. Uh, On you, I this is an isomorphism for less than one third. Yeah. So, getting back to your application, um, you can't apply this in your L function because of the unstable part being in trouble. Uh, bad. Uh, this does not have arithmetic consequences precisely because we cannot control the unstable cohomology. Yes. We have no control of the Bayer numbers. Um, and here we're, we take instead surjection from what Fn G and Z, which we think of as automorphisms of the abelianization of Fn. And then we 
have a system of reducible representations of all the general linear group associated to a pair of partitions. And for such coefficients coming from families of irreducibles defined by pairs of partitions in this case, we also have this uniform stable range. Well, pair of partitions means you take one and the dual the other, or like what would this be lab to you? Uh, something at once. And then yeah, yeah. So yeah. if I have a if I have lambda of length n and mu of length k, I have, I have something that sits inside of v tensor n tensor v dual tensor k. Yeah. And if the sum of length is two bits and you put zero, yes, here. again it's zero. And in particular, that implies uh, the vanishing of stable homology in the range. And the best previous results here were that you had a, a stable range of i up to one half n minus the degree of polynomial coefficient systems. Uh, so we have these two theorems, and we want uh, very much to get an analog of those two theorems from brain groups. Uh, too much material. But let me tell you what the tools are. Uh, the first tool that goes into the argument is cellular EDL. And this is uh, a new approach to homological stability theorem developed by Galatius. Williams, there's a 224 page manuscript on the archive from five years ago. And the second tool is needed is Borel's uh, calculations stable real homology of arithmetic groups. In both these example theorems of mapping class groups and automorphisms of free groups, we have a sequence of arithmetic groups that we pull back our coefficient system from. That's very important. We can only do it under that hypothesis. Um, so now I want to say something about what are cellular EK algebras. This is a completely different approach to homologic stability compared to what Quillen did. Um, The idea is that you take this joint union of the classifying spaces, all of these groups, and the fact that your original groupoid was braided means that this is now a topological E2 algebra. Um, Uh, yeah, maybe this is not the best way to say it. Maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Family of all these is uh, And now the idea is to estimate how you can build this topological E2 algebra using cells. 
uh, um, E2 cells. Um, uh, so if I have R is an E2 algebra, I can define what it means to attach a cell to it in the following way. And it's modeled on how you attach a cell to a CW complex. So you take a free on a boundary of a disk. You suppose you're given a map to R. This sits here into the free whole disk. You can take the push out. And this is now an E2 algebra. Obtained from R by cell attachment. And I said E2 algebra in spaces, but I don't have to be very specific about what category I work in. Formalism works as well in chain complexes or E2 algebras in spectra or simplicial sets. And the idea is that you should prove homological stability theorems by controlling how many cells are needed and where the cells are needed when you build this E2 algebra. If you can prove a vanishing line for where there are generators, where there are cells, then you can deduce homological stability. Um, to start from this guy, which is the E2 algebra you care about, in the same way that you can have uh, every space has a CW approximation, this E2 algebra has, is weakly equivalent to some cellular E2 algebra that you can build from cells, and then you want to estimate how many cells and where there are the cells, specifically. Yes. Yeah. What's in each of us? I don't know if this is helpful. This is also the same thing as so E2 is the operand of little disks. This is an algebra of the little disk operand. Um, so that means that uh, I have operations like this default operations for every way of putting these cells in a smaller cell. And the canonical example of an E2 algebra would be a two-fold loop space. As a two-fold loop space, you can think of as maps from a disk taking the boundary to the base point, and you can insert such maps here. So it has nothing to do with the E2, like the E2 page perspective. No, uh, <laughs> it's completely unrelated. Okay. Yeah. Um, e2 is two-dimensional little disks, and you can have ek algebras and that's k-dimensional balls. Is there, is there a connect? High connect connectedness piece to this? Yes, there is a high connectedness piece here in cellular ek algebras as well, uh, and that's because you can compute where you need cells by taking uh, derived E2 in decomposables, which is um, one thing that measures uh, what cells you need. Uh, so you can take this thing, the derived EK in decomposables, over being R, uh, measures need cells. And this is a version of Hochschild homology or Andre Quillen homology for EK algebras. And when you form this, you can form this in various categories, but when you form it in spaces, and you start from an E2 algebra of this specific form given by a braided monoidal groupoid with discrete groups here. So sorry, in that case, if you took, well, what would be a thing which has just one cell, so the double loop space of the sphere? One cell, that would be uh, configuration spaces of points. 
in Rn considered as an En algebra. The free EK algebra of a point. Uh, oh, sorry, I was going to ask you, what would be a free E2 algebra? An E2 algebra with just one cell in some degree. So yeah, a free E2 algebra on your point that has one, one cell. And the free E2 algebra on a point is configuration spaces of points in the plane. So, yeah, in, okay. in fact, the braid monoid, all of the braid groups, is the free E2 algebra on a point. So, that has one cell in which degree? Uh, Zero one. Okay. But if I wanted a cell in degree zero two or zero three, like one up, a different from zero degree, what would it look like? That would be configurations uh, where I have um, configurations decorated by whatever space I took the free guy on. Okay. So if I take the free guy on a point, I just have configurations, but if I have. So, so kind of what, what you said, like omega two, sigma two of, of, of something is also free in some sense, right? Group like. Ah, okay. So yeah, that's uh, and when you right. So when you are in the particular setting that uh, this is uh, E G M for a family of discrete groups coming from a stability groupoid, this can be calculated in terms of a sequence of simplicial complexes associated with the situation called the splitting complexes, the EK splitting complexes. And that gives you a completely different family of complexes that you can use to calculate um, proof homological stability theorems. Um, and I'm running out of time rapidly. Really wanted to draw a picture. Let me draw that picture. And then... uh, remember, we had in mind that I think you should get to the end of your lecture. Then we'll take a five minute break, and anybody who's really interested will stay on if they have any questions. So, okay. So, any technical stuff you can put. Okay, so let me not do any technical stuff then. And, and... <laughs> no, 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 no. Draw a picture. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm going to draw the picture. It's called a choppy -dubby. Suppose you have a vanishing line here. So here you have the end grading. And here you have homological grading. And let's say we have a generator here in by degree uh, 1, comma 0. This is the thing you're stabilizing with the state. And we want to prove that multiplication by this guy is an isomorphism in a range. And we can imagine that we're not looking at these EK algebras, but we're just looking at commutative differential graded algebras over Q. And then in that case, being cellular means being quasi free. So it means that the underlying uh, ring, when I forget the differential, is a polynomial algebra. I have a differential on it. Now, suppose I know that all of the generators are above this line. Then it would follow that this multiplication by this element gives me an isomorphism between this slot and this slot below the line. And it's the same principle. But if you have a vanishing line for the generators, for the cells, you deduce homological stability below the line. And uh, the key point here is that we know exactly what is the free guy on a point, free guy in this generator, because that's just a polynomial ring on one generator. And the free guy here is generated by x, x squared, x cubed, x to the four. Multiplication by x is, is an isomorphism for that guy. In the EK algebra world, we have to instead know what is the free EK algebra on a point. And we have to know that that has homological stability. So as input into the whole strategy, you have to know homological stability for configuration spaces of points in RK. So it comes from Fred Cohen's thesis. But given that, this is a very good strategy for proving homological stability. Now, let me state the general theorem from the paper with Jeremy, Peter, and Oscar.
we suppose that d to q is a surjection of stability points. And we suppose that b is a family. By that, I mean that the nth object here goes to the nth object and it's level wise surjective. The family of coefficient systems. You mean automorphism group maps on two? Yes, it's the automorphism group Tn maps to the automorphism group Qn surjective. Exactly. B is a family of coefficient systems on Q such that. B is closed under shifts. Um, and B has a uniform stable range. There's a stable range which is the same for every coefficient system in this family B. What's the meaning of closed on? Um, so I have this shift operation on coefficient systems that takes A. N sets a n to be the restriction of a n plus one to a n. Oh, sorry. And we suppose both G and Q are highly connected. or destabilization complexes. Uh, I can in fact prove that if one of these is highly connected and so is the theorem of Randall Williams. Then the pullback of B to G also has a uniform state range. Uh, and you can explicitly estimate the uniform stable range you get on G in terms of the stable range that you had on Q and the connectivities of these two families. So for example, to reduce this theorem, we take G to be the group void of mapping class groups and Q to be the group void of symplectic groups. We would quote uh, results of uh, Oakman for the symplectic group and uh, in the best form, I think is due to, I don't remember, but you know high connectivity already. And what you need is then this fact that V has a uniform stable range. And that is where Borel's work comes in. So in these applications, the conditions on V come from Borel's work. Borel proofs for sequences of classical arithmetic groups that you do have homological stability for families of irreducibles defined in the way that we just did with a stable range that does not depend on the choice of irreducible. And moreover, it has this property of being closed on the shifts because you compute with a branching formula and you see that you restrict from say sp2g plus 2 to sp2g, you get a direct sum of v lambdas. And for every g, you have the same uh, ones appearing. So the shift is a finite direct sum of more v lambdas of the same type. Um, and what is missing for the braid groups is that. We need this condition that G and Q have highly connected destabilization complexes. And in the case of the braid group, 
the image of the Bura representation is a congruent subgroup of the symplectic group. And for that particular family of groups, we don't know high connectivity. There are general results about high connectivity of sequences of congruent subgroups and things that are very, very similar to this sequence of groups have known to be highly connected destabilization complexes, but uh, at the moment we don't have a proof for this particular sequence, but we are working on it and I think it's likely to pan out very soon, but we'll see how that goes. And in particular, this is in sharp contrast with the book of Katz Sarnak, where the only thing you care about is the Sariski closure of the monodromy group. And here we have to know specifically which congruent subgroup do we get. And the precise simplicial complex we get depends very delicately on that group. This specific group matters very much, at least with this proof strategy. Could you tell us a little about what goes into that theorem? Yeah, okay. Um, sure. Uh, so the idea is that. Uh, let, me, let me suggest this just in terms of timing. Also, I want to keep it. So let's make this, this question as part of the question. So first, let's end this lecture slide.